somebody's always turning it up or if it defaults to that, because that seems excessively loud. <laughs> All right. Um, so we'll start, we'll start where we picked off or where we left off, pick up where we left off. That's what the saying goes. Um, and, uh, and work through initiation, propagation, and termination for, for the second step in this process for chlorination of methyl chloride. Which I believe that's that's where we left. You you had a chance to work on that, right? So yeah. I'll just start working through it. The initiations for these is generally not going to be dependent on on our organic reactant. It's usually going to be depend on what the other molecule is. So in this case, if it's chlorine and light, our initiation step is just going to be. All right, Cl2 molecule turns to two chlorine radicals. And then that's easy enough. Our propagation steps, we can, again, we just want them to add up to this, the net reaction. So if we have Chlorine radical plus uh, we'll put hydrogen up here. We don't really care about the rest of the molecule. So we're going to have one electron from the carbon hydrogen bond move to the chlorine, the other one stays on the carbon. So we're going to make HCl, and now we have a carbon-based radical. Then the second initiate or the second propagation step, we need to if we want the initiator molecule to cancel out we need to make another initiator molecule. And if we want our radical, our CH2Cl radical to cancel out, that's gonna be our other reactants. So we need, because if, if we want them to add up, the two reactions to add up to the net reaction, all the radicals have to cancel out. So we need to make another Cl radical. And we're also gonna to need to make our final product CH2Cl2. So then it's going to be our methyl radical plus another chlorine. Fighting me today. But it's going to be the same same general principle. Oops. That radical would stay with the, the carbon. It would transfer to the to the chlorine. So it would be like yeah. So that it's less that it's stable. It and it's not really the radical that's moving. It's that. One radical is so unstable that it goes out and it grabs another radical, which then creates a, a, it's another radical. Um, yeah, if you want to think about electrons as being in relationships, radicals are like home wreckers. They're they're going into what's a stable relationship, and they're ripping one of the people away and creating another unstable radical, which might go out and do the same thing. So it's not really that the radicals moving. The net result looks like the radicals moving. But that's like cargo cations. It's not the positive charge that's moving. It's a vacancy when the electrons move. There's just another vacancy. Yes, exactly. All right, so those are going to be our two, our two propagation steps. Sometimes there are cases where you have to have more than two propagation steps. Um, but typically, if we can set up our reaction properly, 
you only need to draw two propagation steps because um, if we want them to add up to our overall net reaction, our chlorine radical is going to cancel out our other chlorine radical, our, our carbon radical cancel out the other carbon radical. We're going to get chloromethane plus chlorine turns into HCl and direction has that one out and dichloromethane. And so knowing what the overall reaction is, is kind of important when it comes to how do you know how to draw those propagation steps. <clears throat> and then our termination step, again, our rule is we want it to, we want our propagation or our termination step to be the two radicals running into each other that result in our, our major product. So in this case, it's going to be, and usually those are the two radicals that you also canceled out during the propagation steps. So it's going to be a chlorine radical. Whoa, that's new. It's like one of those, it's like a scratcher. <laughs> uh, let's try that again. Okay. Well, this is what happens when I use a decade old tablet. Um, Here's what we do. Do this for a second. So we want it to, we're gonna, it's gonna be our chlorine radical plus that methyl radical, that chloromethyl radical. And the mechanism is going to look like. like that to make That did it. I think Microsoft wants to put out an update to PowerPoint because it also lets me erase all the ink when I white out the screen, and it didn't used to do that. That's a new feature. So my guess is they did some updates to the annotations, and well, you know how updates work. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right. So if we're talking about whether this reaction is favorable or not. You know, in terms of equilibrium, we're always going to come back to, to delta G, right? Um, is there anything about this that suggests that the one side would be favored by entropy? What are the usual things that favor, that are favored um, by entropy? If you get one molecule, well, if you get two molecules from one molecule. Yeah, more molecules. If you can turn one molecule into a gas instead of being solid or liquid, mixing typically is an advantage, is favored by entropy. Do we see any of that here? No. So in general, it's just going to be bonds broken and bonds formed. That drive, that drive this. It's going to be driven almost entirely by the enthalpy, um, which means temperature doesn't really affect it, which is kind of nice. We can do this at whatever temperature is convenient. Um, it's also kind of limiting on what you can do. It is. It, it means we don't have a whole lot of control. Um, and it means typically that this isn't really reversible in a normal sense. Um, if enthalpy is the dominant factor and entropy doesn't really play a role, then changing the temperature is not going to do anything to favor one side or the other. Um, so these are kind of brute force mechanisms. We don't see a whole lot of finesse with these. 
But that said, that they're a really convenient way to be able to put a halogen on an alkane, an alkane with no other functional groups. We don't really have any other reactions we can do with it, right? We can burn it, but beyond that, there's nothing to do. So these halogenation reactions are useful in the sense that it, it's a way to put a handle, so to speak, a functional group we can work with on the on on anything, any hydrocarbon really, um, but especially on alkanes that don't have any other functional groups. Um, and so if we actually go through and look at the different halogens, the delta H of formation for fluorine, breaking the fluorine fluorine bonds is the is or that the halogen bonds is really the most downhill part halogen halogen bonds are not stable really so being able to break them apart to make a carbon halogen bond is almost always going to be favorable um but you can see looking at the numbers there fluorine is super downhill in energy it's so exothermic we basically can't use fluorine um if you try to use fluorine to do this reaction that you're going to set stuff on fire. Um, so we don't use fluorine. Chlorine is still kind of nasty, but it's um, it's something we can work with. Bromine is slow, but predictable. Um, and bromine is also a better leaving group than chlorine. So if we're going to turn around and use our product in some sort of um, SN2 or elimination reaction, bromine is a really good molecule to use for that. And then iodine is actually uphill in energy. Iodine is actually stable enough as a molecule um, that, and hydrogen, hydrogen iodide is unstable enough that we actually would be uphill in energy to make that reaction happen. So really, bromine's kind of the sweet spot. Bromine's a sweet spot if you have time. Chlorine is nice because it does, it's not a great leaving group. So when you make dichlorometh dichloromethane is a better solvent than dibromomethane, um, just because bromine would produce would interact too much and have too many side reactions. So the chlorine is useful in that respect because it's more stable once you make the um the chloromethane, and bromine's useful because it's less stable. Um, and so if we actually wanted to make methyl iodide, um, we would actually start by making bromomethane and then having it go through an SN2 reaction. Because remember, if we, if we play around with the solvent, we can get iodine to be a stronger nucleophile than bromide. Um, so, if we, so to make those iodides, those alkyl iodides, we start by doing using bromine to do this process and then follow it up um, with with iodide, with sodium iodide probably in a polar aprotic solvent. So, so you make the alkyl bromide um, and then make it do an alkyl iodide. iodide. Yeah. So it's two steps, but because we can't just put the iodine on there on its own and and remember that all of our our halides, they did that weird flip when we switched the solvent just right. If it was, and I think I actually said it wrong a second ago, in a protic solvent, the larger halogens are better nucleophiles, right? Because they could be stabilized less by the small water molecules. So I think if we, if we, even though normally we would think of iodine as a better leaving group, if we did it in a protic solvent, we could get iodine, iodide to be the better nucleophile and bromide the better leaving group. Um, so we, that's another case where it, we leverage the tools we have, um, and that results in a pretty useful workaround, so to speak. And it's a little bit, to go back to, um, altitude analogies. Um, if you're, if your car can't make it up Mount Rose, cause it's too steep, then you, what do you do? You go around Spooner, right? It's longer and you have to go through two passes, but it's something that your car might be able to handle. And in general, too, we wind up seeing that 
this is, if it's going to be the same mechanism, but with slightly different energies, um, if something that's more exothermic also typically is going to have a lower transition state barrier. Um, and the reason behind that is if we look at, if we think of the, um, the, pro the reactants, and the products as being two, didn't draw that big enough, hang on. Being two parabolas. The transition state occurs where roughly where they where the lines intersect. Right? It's a little bit more rounded than that because it's actually a linear combination of these two parabolas. Um, so we get something that's a little bit more, you know, rounded looking. But at the same time, if we just take, think about it as these two parabolas, what happens if I move the right hand parabola downward? If I move, move this part downward. I also drop the, the activation energy. So it's energy in fact. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So looking at this as a potential energy surface. So if it's going to be the same mechanism, we know that it's more or less going to be the same, the same pass. But if we can lower one end of it, that's going to make the activation energy lowered as well. This doesn't happen if there's if catalysis is involved. That's like finding a shortcut going a totally different way. Um, and so that it doesn't apply to something like that. But if it's the same mechanism with two different product energies, we can make this assumption that a lower that something that's more exothermic will also have a lower activation energy. Which yeah, it's the kinetic side. Yeah, exactly. So um Again, we can't always say this, but the more downhill in energy the reaction is going to be, not only is, is the equilibrium constant going to be bigger, but also it'll be yeah. the reaction will be faster. So out of these steps, since they both are going through the same the same process and it's really the the initiating step doesn't really affect um the initiation step doesn't really affect the kinetics because it only has to happen once really the propagation steps are the ongoing process and so those are the ones that are really going to affect the rate um which it's also where the kinetics here, we're getting into more complicated kinetics than we saw in Gen Chem. In Gen Chem, it was either zero order, first order, second order, right? There wasn't really a whole lot past that. It's a gray, gray area. Turns out there's a gray area, right? Especially when you get into biochem, enzyme kinetics are their whole thing. I believe that there was a Nobel Prize awarded um, for enzyme kinetics because they're first order sometimes and zero order other times and in between they can be something else. Yeah, it's because, it's, um, the, because it's a catalyst or because it's a catalyst. Basically for enzymes you can if you if you need a catalyst for the reaction to happen and the, the rate limiting step is usually the actual reaction, but you have to have a spot for your your reactants to bind to an enzyme. And so if you have, if your concentrations of your reactants get too large relative to your enzyme concentration, you're actually limited by how much enzyme you have, not by how much product and re or how much reactant you have. And so it sort of switches like everything, almost everything in, in your body when it comes to your N2 enzymes, when it's operating normally is a first order process where you increase concentration of substrate rate increases, right? But if you have, there are certain processes that we flood the body. For instance, the way your body gets rid of alcohol is actually a zero order reaction because the amount of alcohol dehydrogenase your body has is more or less fixed until you develop tolerance. 
and when it, it's basically working at full capacity to try and eliminate ethanol from your bloodstream. Yeah, and that's why there's like that rule of thumb that they teach that they, I don't know if they teach this, but I remember being taught when in driver's ed even when I was like 15, like if you have a drink, you have to wait one hour for every drink you have before you can drive. The reason that's a constant amount per drink and it doesn't get better at eliminating alcohol, the more alcohol you have, it's because it's a zero order reaction when you get to that point. And so the, all that to say, um, these kinetics are going to get more complicated, especially when catalysts are involved. Um, but that means we can understand our world better, right? Um, so out of these two steps, looking at the Delta H for the two steps, which is going to be the rate limiting step. The first one. Yeah, the hydrogen abstraction is by far the harder step. Um, and which kind of makes sense because our halogen halogen bonds are not that strong. That was kind of what was driving the whole thing, right? And so this second step is pretty easy, um, relatively speaking. And the first step is the slower one. So this is to say that um, the hydrogen abstraction is always going to be slower than the halogen abstraction. Yes. Yeah, and um, that gives us a little bit of, of ways we can control this because if we can control if we can control how much of the halogen we have, then we can control how fast the reaction is progressing, and it's to our advantage in some cases to slow down the reaction. Uh, because if we have the reaction happening really quickly, a lot of times we're going to get more products. Yeah, we get to the end faster, but we get a lot more side reactions happening. But if we can control it better, uh, we wind up getting mostly just the thermodynamic, thermodynamically favored product. So that's this is another case of bromine is sort of the sweet spot because this first step is the slowest is slow with bromine. Bromine is way more specific about which hydrogens it will grab. Chlorine will grab whatever it bumps into first. So remember when we first talked about radicals, it was like, oh, what's the easiest hydrogen to pull off? Um, well, chlorine is so reactive, it'll get, it'll pull that one off more, but it's really gonna pull off everything that it bumps into. So if you have some, you don't get a lot of specificity with chlorine. Yeah, the reaction happens faster and more completely, but you don't get just one product. You get a mess of all possible products. Um, and here's the what the two different steps look like. Um, and these are roughly to scale. So remember that the, I guess not, not quite because the chlorine one would be, have to be drawn much larger because chlorine from here to here was something like minus, minus 100 kilojoules. And this one was minus 30 kilojoules. So by slowing things down, we can still have something that's very highly favored at equilibrium and happens relatively quickly, but it also happens somewhat selectively. All right, so let's talk about statistics here a little bit because with with these really reactive radicals, we get we get something resembling what's called the statistical mixture. If chlorine is strong enough to pull off whatever it runs into, um, without regard to how stable it is, then what's going to limit or what's going to determine our our distribution of products? is usually just how many hydrogens there are that lead to each product. So for this first one, there are two, two hydrogens that chlorine could replace that give you the two chloropropane, and there's six hydrogens that it could grab that give it the, the one chloropropane. 
And so that's what we would call the statistical mixture is if we actually saw a 25 to 75 ratio, three to one ratio. Hysterics literally do with it, or it's just like one to, to some extent it does, but typically it's the sterics wind up not interacting quite as much because they're also going to affect how many options you have. If we made it harder to get to that that carbon two, how would we do that? Well, by having other groups attached to carbon two, so it also affects the statistics. Um, and really, because of how reactive chlorine is, we do see something that's pretty similar. It's not quite um, 75 to 25. It's it's actually 60-40 in favor of the, the middle carbon. So it's not the statistical mixture. It's getting, it's kind of close. To, it's not as specific as we might expect, though, based on how stable those intermediates should be. Um, if we did this with fluorine, it would be a lot closer to that to that 75 to 25, the other direction, because of how, how um, reactive fluorine. But part of this is, is tra just trying to demonstrate they did this as a way of, of sorry, something on my screen. Um, they did this study as a way of demonstrating that it's not purely statistics. It's not just as unstable as the free radicals are. Um, there must be some selectivity beyond that. And so if you look at, again, look at the potential energy surface for the hydrogen abstraction step, if you can make a secondary radical and the secondary radical is, you know, 30 kilojoules per mole more stable, that's also going to affect the kinetics of that step as well, right? It's not just about how stable the chlorine radical is. It's also about how stable that, that other radical, the uh, alkyl radical is. Um, and this, this is kind of a weird concept, um, but there's a, an idea called the Hammond postulate that says that whatever is, whatever is closest to the transition state in terms of energy kind of dictates what shape the transition state has. Me, and by that, I mean things like actual bond lengths and geometries. If we know what the, what the products and the reactants geometries are, the transition state is going to be closer to whichever one is higher in energy because it's that higher energy state is already close to the activation energy. Um, so for chlorine, the one on the on the left, our reactants were all were higher in energy than our intermediates. Our intermediates are downhill in energy, which means our, re, our transition state looks a lot like just a chlorine radical approaching a hydrogen. On the flip side, the because bromine is uphill in energy to make the intermediates, the transition state looks a lot more like like the intermediates. It looks a lot more like hydrogen and hydrogen bromide gas with a carbo with a carbon radical. So it would look something more like. closer to that, it's still going to be a little bit, you're still going to be able to see bonds, like it's the transition is really going to be halfway in between the, the reactants, but it's going to be closer. It's not exactly halfway. It's not true halfway. It's going to look more like um, the intermediates in the case of bromine. It's going to look more like the reactants for the step in the case of the fluoride. 
So why does that matter? That's okay, it's a weird idea. Why do, why do we care about it? Um, because this also helps explain why bromide is a lot more stereoselective. I'm sorry, not sorry, regioselective. It's a lot more picky about which hydrogen it grabs. Because if the bromine pulling off the hydrogen is going to make a radical, we're going to try to make the most stable radical possible. We have to get all the way uphill in energy just to get to that transition state, right? So the height of that hill is dependent on how stable the intermediate is. This, the stability of the intermediate matters a lot less with chlorine because the transition state is so much closer to what the reactants look like, not what the products look like. So how does that affect? So here's a, a picture that better draws what I was trying to show. And it uses a delta radical symbol, um, just like we'd normally do delta plus or delta minus for partial charges. It's using that to indicate a partial radical character. It's like half half of a radical. Um, what that the net result, the practical result that we can actually see from that is right there. When you do if you do this with methyl methyl propane and you chlorinate it, you get a mixture that's 65 to 35 in favor of the primary chlorine because it's there's nine hydrogens. There's the hydrogens on it's not working. Whatever. Um there's all of these. Jeez, I really messed it up. Well, we might have to take a break just so I can reboot my computer. Um, all three of these methyls, each of them has a, has three protons on it, right? They could be pulled off. And so there's nine possible hydrogens that a chloride radical could grab that would give you the primary. Um, and there's one, the most stable one to grab is still right in the middle on carbon two, but there's only, it's a, you know, it's got a one in nine chance of running into that one. So you wind up with a lot more of a mixture in this case. However, if you use bromide, the stability of the radical, of the carbon radical, becomes so much more important because that's what's controlling how high that activation energy is. So with that in mind, bromide, like we said before, is sort of the sweet spot um, where we get just just about, in, the, in this case, if we're doing a primary versus a tertiary, that favors it enough that it's almost 100% of it is, is the, the tertiary bromide. If it was tertiary versus secondary, it wouldn't quite be as high of a percentage, but it would still dramatically favor putting it on the, the um, tertiary compared to the secondary, right? In other words, just that our radical stability rules matter more when it's a bromide. So for the sake of doing synthesis problems, we're pretty much always gonna to wanna to use bromide because we can control what we get. Even if we wanted the primary one, we don't really wanna deal with a mixture of products. It's better to go through three reactions in a row than one reaction that gives you a mess of products because then you have to clean it up and you're limited to you know, at best, after you do all your purification steps, you might get 65% of your product that looks like that. Versus if we did this and we made, and we got 100% of our product was the secondary or was the tertiary bromide, and then we did an elimination reaction, and then we did the anti-Markovnikov addition, yeah, that's three reactions, but if each of those has 90% yield, or 100% yield for the first one and then 90% yield, that's overall a better total efficiency, right? A better yield. Um, I don't think we've talked much or at all about, um, about how if you have successive 
reactions, how that affects your yield. But they, it's kind of like compounding interest. You take your, your yield from the first reaction and then you multiply it by your yield from the second reaction. And then you multiply it by your yield for the, for the third reaction. So if we were trying to do this, we'll use the same one since there's numbers there. If we were trying to make this molecule or a bromide would work too, if you do it like that, we would get 65% yield. If we did it the long way with bromide, we would get 100% yield to make the tertiary bromide, and then maybe the elimination reaction is an 80% yield. To make this molecule, right? And then maybe we get a 95% yield to do that um, for the last step to get us to the bromide. The overall yield for that process would be 100%, so 1 times 0.8 times 0.95, which I should have picked more friendly numbers because I can't quite do that in my head, but I know it's going to be more than what's it going to, it's going to be 76%. 80 times 95, I think is 76 or percent. So we gain, even though it's three different reactions, it might be more expensive to go that route. But if, if 10 or 12% yield is an advantage, it gives us a product that is that much more valuable then it still might be worth it to go that route. Plus, then we have to deal with fewer side reactors, other products getting rid of the other product um, in a lot of cases. So every step would be its own like purification step. Typically, a lot of times there, there are reactions, that they, they call them one pot synthesis, where you can do like three reactions in a row all in the same pot, just in the same reaction vessel, just by adding the right reactants at the right time. Um, sort of like making a casserole, but they're, they tend to be less efficient. They are, they get chosen mostly for convenience sake. At the industrial level, they're pretty much always going to go through and do the purification because they're trying to maximize product. They don't care as much about, about, um, um, making it complicated, they care more about getting every percent of yield out that they can. All right, so with that in mind, what is the major product we would get from brominating this molecule? Yes. So there's a quaternary carbon that doesn't have a hydrogen it can abstract, right? So it's not going to go there. There's a secondary right here. There's a bunch of methyls that would all give us the same product. actually color code this. So one, two, three, all of those would give us the same product. Both of these would give us the same product. 
And there's the secondary carbon. But our most stable intermediate is going to be the blue one there. So our product that we would get would look like Would look like that and it would favor it we'd still get a measurable amount if we if we took the results here and we put it through the gc we would we would definitely see more than just one peak even though it said 100 percent yield relative to the primary there's 15 hydrogens that it could react with that would give a primary product that's going to be both of those, the, the orange one, the orange yellow one, and the red product are both going to be measurable amounts. They're just going to be sub 1%. Um, and the green one might be more measurable, might be a couple percent, 5%, maybe even um, of your product would be have a bromine in the, on the green carbon. And if we did this with chlorine, we're really going to get a mess of products. We're going to, we might even be, it would be almost impossible to pick a major product because there's 15 hydrogens that give you the primary, even if they're two different primary products, there's a lot of, that's where your sterics come in with the statistics, right? There's a lot higher probability it runs into either the orange or the red than it makes it to the blue. So um, on a test, I'd be more likely to if it's a bromine, I'm more likely to ask it like this, what's the one major product? Um, but I might ask a, just like with our SN2 or our substitution elimination test from last quarter, where we said, um, draw all the possible products and then pick the major product. Chlorination is going to be more like that, um, where it'd be like, draw everything that you could get because you're going to get some of it. Um, and I'd be pretty unlikely to even have you guess what the major product is, is in a molecule this complicated. All right, let's take a break. I'm going to go fill up my, actually, I'm going to run over to the other end of campus and get a cup of coffee. That's what I'm going to do. And then we'll, uh, Come back at uh, at eleven, and we'll continue on here talking about stereochemistry and then doing some practice. Just for coffee. No, you have to pay for it, but it's out of a vending machine. That's one of like the nice ones you can get, like a latte ish. It's it's adequate. So I'll be back in a minute. Prop this open so we don't get locked out again. Thanks. 
Apologies, it took a little bit longer than expected. Well, I tried to buy my wife a mocha because she's having a day and it just dispensed just the espresso part of the mocha. Um, so I'm drinking the espresso and I got her a latte. The latte actually worked, but it's, yeah, apparently I'm not a mocha person anyway, so I'm okay with this. Uh, all right. Uh, we already mentioned this on Tuesday, um, but because we had a trigonal planar intermediate or it's um, in the course of the reaction, we're not really going to get any sort of um, stereochemistry favored unless there are some other sterics involved. If we had something like a, you know, a cyclopentane ring with a big bulky group on one side of it, then just based on the sterics, we'd favor making the trans product. But in general, we're just going to kind of get a mix. Um, just a reminder that that word racemic means that it's approximately 50-50. I think technically racemic means that it's it's 50-50 exactly within sig figs. Um, but, you know, that it can vary from that a little bit if there are weird Sterics involved. If we started with, just like with SN1 reactions, if we started with any sort of stereochemistry, we lose that stereochemistry over the course of the, of the reaction, which makes sense. We took something that was, that was tetrahedral, we made it flat and then made it just as easy to attack from either side, right? So, Nothing really groundbreaking there. It's things we've seen. Um, so this is just a good page of practice for, for drawing um, these and taking these into consideration. So for A, it's radical bromination. So we're not gonna get the random mixture of everything. We're just going to make one major product. Where are we gonna add that bromine for A? To the one tertiary. To the one tertiary carbon, easy enough, right? And we're not going to get a racemic mixture there, right? Because we only, there is no enantiomer. We didn't make a stereo center. For B, what are we going to get? It's also going to go on that tertiary. It's also going to go on the tertiary carbon. And now we do have. Stereo center. So we're going to get that racemic mixture in this case. Same with C, it's going to be another racemic mixture. D is the interesting one because it does bring in some sterics into effect, right? We're going to get a mixture of two products, even though it's with bromine, we're still going to get a mixture of two products here. So this is what's called, the bromination is what's called regio-specific, meaning it will add very specifically to one carbon, but it's not stereo-specific, meaning you only get one stereoisomer. So we will still get two products out of D. So we can start by drawing them. We're gonna get a methyl up and bromine down. And we can't just say plus enantiomer. Because there's the other stereos and we're only flipping one of them. Good. 
So which of these would we expect to be favored? On the left? Yeah. It's as simple as bromine's big and the t-butyl group's big, right? Because it's a ring structure this time. Because it's a ring structure, so we don't have freely rotating. And so that that T butyl group and the methyl group are both going to stay where they are. That configuration is preserved because nothing's happening over there. So you've got something small on the bottom of the ring, something big on the top of the ring. So even though in theory the bromine can attack from either side, top or bottom, to get that because the intermediate is planar. There's just more room for the bromine to come in opposite from the T butyl group. But other than, in, in, you know, depending on how big the group is, if it was an isopropyl group, then it'd be close to a 50 50 mixture. If it was, you know, an ethyl group, it would be like maybe 55 45. Um, if it was, an, you know, an ethyl on one side and a methyl on the other, because those aren't that differently sized. The bigger you make that other group, the more the, it's going to affect that, and the more you're going to favor having the bromine approach from the opposite side. And what like ratio? How do you predict for that? With a T butyl group. 75 25 probably maybe even more in favor of the of the trans putting the bromine trans from the um that's one of those ones that we like even i would have to to go look at either look up numbers if somebody's done this reaction um or we can actually we can estimate what the product yields are going to be if we know what the relative energies are um if we know how much steric stress it is to, to put them there. We can actually back back out the numbers and then plug it into. Um, I think it's only technically the Arrhenius equation if it's talking about kinetic, which I guess it would be in this case. Um, the the rate constant for each of them is going to follow the same basic formula. A is going to be relative is going to be slightly different between the two possibilities that, um, because A factors in what are the odds that it approaches from the right direction. And so that's one of the places that um, we actually will see a difference here because the odds that the bromine is able to hit the top from this from the right angle for this to happen um, is going to be slightly less because the T butyl group is there. There's just um, you know, if you think of it as like trying to throw a dart and hit a bullseye, the bullseye is a reaction. See, having the T butyl group there is if you're trying to throw a dart and hit a bullseye and your drunk friend is standing between you and the dartboard. Oh, yeah, you can still do it. It's still possible. And the bigger your friend is, the harder it's going to be to hit that bullseye, right? Um, and then the activation energy will also be slightly affected by that as well because you're making a product that is less stable if you've got these two big groups pushing on each other. So I actually went back and I looked up, I read Svante Arrhenius's um, biography or Wikipedia bi biography after, after class the other day. So not only did he come up with the term greenhouse gas and predicted global warming, um, he came up with this equation that shows up all over the place. Uh, significant, I want to say before Bolts, must couldn't have been before Boltzmann because R had to have been defined. So this is Arrhenius's two? This is Arrhenius's two. And it's not even what he won his Nobel Prize for. He won his Nobel Prize for the idea that when you put ions in, in solution, that they, ionic compounds in solution, that they split into ions. Um, and then he went on to define an acid is something that increases the amount of H plus floating around. So he was all over the place um, in terms of 
I think in Gen Chem, that right there is like four things that we teach you that are <laughs> they're directly related to him. All right, so when we bring resonance into the picture, as usual, things get more complicated, but also not because at the same time, um, bromine is still going to be really picky about which hydrogen it pulls off, right? So we still can say that it's going to be very regioselective. Um, it just means that we have a new option for where we're going to put it. Instead of putting it, if we look at the, these are the bond association energies. Pulling off a of vanillic hydrogen is really hard. 444 kilojoules per mole to, ab to abstract that. Um, pulling off a secondary hydrogen is 402 kilojoules per mole. So 40 kilojoules per mole more favorable to do that. Pulling off a allylic hydrogen is 40 kilojoules per mole more favorable than that. So if there is an allylic position, if you or benzylic, if you've got a resonance stabilized like, uh, carbon radical, then that's going to be where the bromine reacts, where the bromine abstracts that hydrogen. So pretty much, and just like before, we're, for all intents and purposes, 100% of the yield um, is going to wind up being in that allylic position. Even if there's a tertiary carbon available, it's still going to be close to 100% of your product is, is resonance stabilized. Problem with that is that we already have a reaction for an alkene plus bromine, right? So if we're trying to limit how much of the side reaction we have, we don't want to use just bromine. Um, and so in, if we're trying to selectively place a bromine in the allylic position, we actually use a compound called N-bromosuccinamide. NBS, um, which is which looks like this, because this will still generate a bromine radical when you shine light on it, but it doesn't have other bromine around. It doesn't have true bromine. You still can't have too much of the bromine radicals around, or you'll start making bromine, and then you'll then you have your competing reaction again. So typically we do this with at a low concentration of NBS, but it gives us a very, very specific product that way. We get very regioselective um, where it's almost entirely going to be in the allylic position. Um, and typically the way we write it in a reaction is we just say NBS. Instead of saying Br2, we say NBS and light. So the light is still there to show that it's a, a free radical reaction. You just have to know what NBS is. You don't need to know the whole structure. You just need to know that it makes a bromine radical. Um, and even technically, you would want to show this as your initiation step if you're writing out the mechanism for this one. Um, but if you can't remember the entire, it's not, the rest of the structure is not that important. Um, the succinamide part, we just need to know that, okay, I've got a bromine attached to a nitrogen and some other stuff. And when I shine light on it, I get a, bromo, a bromine radical and then this resonance stabilized succinamide radical. But it's a good radical. It's still a radical, so it's still reactive, but it's stable. Yeah, it's a lot more stable than it would be because it's stabilized twice. It's still going to create, this is still not going to be that clean of a reaction in terms of there's going to be a bunch of other junk left over. Um, probably, you know, a lot of which is because of the succinamide is going to go on and react with other stuff as well. But the bromine radical is much more reactive and more selectively so. So we are still gonna get a pretty good yield if we go this route. 
Um, and there are some radicals that are, there's probably some way to minimize that. Um, our body actually has all, all eukaryotic cells um, actually have a way of, of um, minimizing free radicals. Eukaryotic cells have mitochondria, right? So they go through that electron transport chain, um, which you'll learn in a lot more detail when you take upper division biochem. Um, but the, one of the most important steps in there is the reduction, sorry, yeah, reduction of oxygen gas, which makes a peroxide. It happens one electron at a time in the electron transport chain. And so you make a peroxide that your body, that the ETC tries to hold on to really tightly, but it, yeah, it doesn't hold it off perfectly. So some small, small but finite percent of the time, your body lets go of a peroxide uh, molecule. It turns into a radical in your cells, which is why eventually every living thing will eventually get cancer of some sort because we are constantly have free radicals just because we breathe oxygen. Um, so with that in mind, are the cells that are the most effective at preventing that are the ones, not just the ones that hold on to it really tightly. They actually have, um, free radical scavenging molecules and succinamide is one of those. Um, and those are that are known as antioxidants. That's what an antioxidant is, is a free radical scavenger that goes around and it can accept or give away one electron at a time. And it's stable either way. So a lot of them are based around copper as well, because if you have copper, it can be a plus one or a plus two, or it can be neutral, right? So if you have copper plus one, it can ex it can give away one electron to become copper plus two, which takes a radical and stabilizes it, because now it's not a radical anymore because it just gained an electron. And if you and then it can go around and it can if it runs into another radical when it's copper plus two it can shift it back to being copper plus one, and so that there's a lot of mechanisms that are dedicated to just going around and cleaning up the mess, um, and succinamide being resonance stabilized is a pretty useful molecule that way biologically that there's a lot of antioxidants have similar structures because they can accept or give up one electron at a time that way. Are they usually um stabilized by resonance is that like the, the yeah metal? it's they're either metal they either have metal ions embedded in them because there's a lot of transition metals that can have two stable charges right um and i said copper but i don't think it's actually copper and i want now i want to say it's like manganese maybe um but there's a few of them in the first row of the d block that have that have um stable charges that differ by one so they're pretty useful for that in that respect. Um, but then there are some others that are free radicals that are that are stabilized by resonance, which is actually how the body, no, that's where the manganese is. Manganese is in the electron transport chain. It's one of the enzymes that can that gives one electron at a time to, to reduce the oxygen. I had that all memorized when I took biochem at one point, but it's been a few years. All right, so in this case, for this molecule, we see NBS plus light. Where are we putting the bromine? On the allylic. Both of us be the tertiary. Which also happens to be the tertiary one, right? So doubly favored in this case. All right, so just did this one. So I need to do that one. Do you want to go through the rest of these and do some practice problems? Sure. 
nothing too tricky about the, the first two, other than you just gotta remember iodine doesn't do this. Um, <clears throat> and for the NBS one, there's only really one choice at this point, we don't, turns out there are ways we can, we can replace a hydrogen on a benzene ring, but we don't, haven't learned them yet. And so we've just been looking at SP3 hydrogens being replaced, right? If we did this, if we did reaction D with just plain benzene, we probably couldn't do it with bromine because it's not downhill in energy enough, but there are hydrogens on benzene that we could act abstract, right? But we probably need something more reactive to do it. We'd get a benzene chlorine. radical, but if we use chlorine, we could make chlorobenzene this way probably. Um, but doing it with NBS especially, but bromine in general, we're not going to, to pull off any of those allylic. Um, and this is where the, it's not, or sorry, we're not gonna pull off the vanillic or I believe they call that a, the phenyl hydrogens. I'm blanking on the term um, for a hydrogen that's attached to a benzene. It's not benzylic because that's one away from, one carbon away from a benzene ring. So phenolic, that's when you have an oxygen H. So I think it's just a phenyl hydrogen but I'm blanking. I'll, I'll look it up at some point. Um, F is only really tricky in the sense that you have to remember that you're not just looking for the most substituted carbon. It's the most substituted carbon that also has a hydrogen you can remove. So you just got, there's a reason so many of these examples have quaternary carbons and it's to remind you, no, quaternary carbons don't do this because you can't have a carbon with five bonds. So you have to look for the tertiary carbons, most substituted up to tertiary. And then this, the reason I left C is because C is, one C is gonna have three different products and measurable amounts of all three of them, but which one's going to be the most? Look for it on the primary. There's, so there's six, I probably wouldn't mark you down for that at this point, per se, putting it on the primary carbon. Um, there's six hydrogens that give you that molecule, but there's, there's also six secondary hydrogens as well, right? Um, at two of which give you the same product. Right. Oh, okay. So probably two chloro is going to be more favorable, although then. But then there's also there's the, where you could really split hairs with that one is that on the two chloro you're going to make something that has stereochemistry, right? So you're going to get a racemic mixture of two different stereoisomers. Do you consider those the same product or not? If you consider them the same product, then that would be your major product. If they're not the same product, then it's probably the primary one because there is no stereochemistry. All six hydrogens give the same uh, molecule. So that one's that one's tricky for that reason. That's why I slowed, slowed down, slowed down. To look at that one. I remember correctly at some point. Um, I think I have some numbers and some some good like general rules to how you decide based on the number of hydrogens, whether a chlorine will go here or there. Um, but I don't think they're in this slide deck. So we'll, we'll look at those probably next week. Um, just more practice. B is probably the most interesting one here because we have three. Allylic positions, right? So which of those is going to be 
when actually if we're taking stereochemistry into, into account, there's really a lot of products, right? Would it mostly be attached to the one on the bottom? I guess like sterics is really... Sterics aren't really going to play a role because it's all flat, right? So you're going to get... Most of it is going to go... It probably split pretty evenly between the top and the bottom. Probably nothing significant is going to come out of there because the primary allylic is less stable than a secondary allylic. Um, in all likelihood, it's going to be about 50-50. And then of those, they each have two stereoisomers, right? You could have the bromine up and the methyl. Or there is no methyl. The bromine up. On this spot or bromine down in the same position. These cheap styluses that I bought at the beginning of COVID now finally, finally dying. I have to actually get a better, better stylus. And then lifetime for for a stylus. It's not it's not half bad, frankly. Um, I think I spent like ten bucks on them okay. in in twenty twenty. So I've I've definitely gotten my money's worth out of it. Um, then again, if I can leverage that into getting a full tablet that comes with a stylus, that might be even better. Especially if I can make the college pay for it. There we go. <laughs> All right, and then we get the same thing. We get the same mixture on the bottom carbon as well. So pretty, pretty even amount of all four of those. There's not a, a whole lot to favor um, either the, the enantiomers in each case, and there's not a whole lot to favor the top carbon versus the bottom carbon. If one of them was tertiary allylic, then yeah, we'd have, you know, we'd have a racemic mixture of wherever putting it on the tertiary carbon. But uh, as it is, we'd get four products. And then here's the mechanism. We talked about this a little bit <clears throat> um, where the acid catalyzed addition of hydrobromination is Markovnikov addition under normal circumstances, right? Then we said, but if there's peroxide around, it goes the opposite direction. You get the anti Markovnikov addition. So putting the bromine on the less substituted carbon, if there's any trace amounts of peroxide. Um, and this is the one that had the historical significance of they couldn't figure it out. And it was because they ordered from a different vendor that gave them something that wasn't as pure. Um, I believe it. I believe it was the HBR that wasn't as pure. And it just had trace amounts of peroxides, which only mattered, it turned out, that, um, in organic chemistry. Having trace amounts of peroxides was no big deal if you were just using your HBR to make you know, an acid solution for inorganic chemistry. Organ the peroxides didn't really affect it. But once, uh, once we understand it, it's a really, really useful tool to be able to just by adding a little bit of peroxide, we can get the reaction to go anti Markovnikov. And it can really be any peroxide. And it's very selective. And so the mechanism for this, starts with an initiation step. That peroxide, and it turns out all it takes is heat for a lot of peroxides. If you heat a peroxide or shine light on it, you get two peroxide radicals, which then do a hydrogen abstraction from the HBR. 
So we actually have two, two steps. Technically, the second step is not an initiation step because we get the same number of radicals on both sides. Um, but it's frequently written as an, as an initiation step because this, this shows that you don't need a ton of peroxide. You don't need a stoichiometric amount of the peroxide uh, because once you start this process and start making the bromine radicals, it can continue on without needing additional peroxide. Um, I wouldn't be picky if you were writing this on a test. If you called the second step a propagation step, you wouldn't be wrong, but it doesn't add up to your overall net reaction if you do that. So that's, that's probably the, the main reason to do this to uh, consider an initiation step is so that our propagation steps meet our requirement of, they add up to the net reaction. Um, so then our first propagation step is gonna be an addition where we, we're gonna break a pi bond, make a new carbon bromine sigma bond. So basically the, what separates this from the regular hydrogen um, hydrobromination is the fact that this the first step with that involves the alkene is the bromine attacking. Before it was you started with hydrogen attacking, which leaves left the carbocation. Now because the bromine adds first, it adds to the less substituted carbon so that we can make our um, radical more stable and put it on the more substituted or in the allylic position if there's other resonance happening. And then once we have the carbocation radical, it can continue the reaction by finding another HBr molecule. So we do another hydrogen abstraction from the, from the hydrogen bromide, and now we made another bromide radical. And all of these other than, than our very first initiation step are all downhill in energy. So this is another case of once you get this thing going, it goes until you run out of everything. And then your term, termination step doesn't follow our, we can't really write a termination step that gives us our, our net organic product in this case, because we didn't actually make any radical, the right radicals to do that. Um, because it involved the pi bond breaking, we're, we're not gonna be able to do that. So you just pick two radicals that it does make and show them running into each other. Could be bromide bromide, could be a bromide and our carbon radical for a dibromination. There will be some small amount of dibromination product at the very end. Um, but it's not really all that important which of them you pick for the termination steps in this case, especially. So this is actually really this gives us a lot of options with bromide now because with the with NBS, we can put the bromide in the allylic position. With HBr and peroxides, we get the anti-Markovnikov addition. And with just HBr, we just get the Markovnikov addition. So that right there gives us a lot of control over where we're going to put a bromide and bromides themselves are super useful because then we, that opens up all of our elimination and substitution reactions. Um, so we see this, this is a super common thing to do in synthesis is to start by make a bromide, put your bromine where you want it. And now you've got something you can manipulate. Um, why didn't, the bromine abstract from the, let me go back to the last page. Why didn't the bromide pull off the allylic? Because the pi bond has more, like just more available for, it's got more electron density, yeah. And and it's downhill in energy by 25 kilojoules per mole to break up that pi bond and make the, the radical 
If I go back to NBS reaction. Doesn't have the numbers here, but yeah, effectively, if you have if you have enough of the bromide around, some of it will um, go through these side reactions. It's really just just law of large numbers. So that's one of the reasons why the NBS is so useful is because by keeping the bromine concentration really low that gives it time, basically, it slows everything down. So it's only gonna pick the most stable, the easiest hydrogen to abstract, and it won't break up that pi bond as much. Um, and so we can, we can uh, kind of tweak between either of these mechanisms based on, uh, based on concentrations. Low concentrations favor the most stable radical intermediate, which is the allylic one. High concentrations favor making the addition product mostly just based on the kinetics and the odds of bumping into that pi bond is a lot bigger. Um, but, and that's more from a practical standpoint in the lab. Um, the way on the test, the way we signal the differences is, is with what reactants we have. The practical effect of NBS is that it keeps the bromine radical concentration low, which favors the allylic position. HBr and peroxides technically can do, will make both of those products, both of these, but we're going to most likely Let's we'll just go through this one pretty quickly, just in, we'll save this one. We don't need to add a whole other mechanism right now. So let's do this practice. Sorry, what, what were you saying? I was just like trying to pronounce this auto oxidation. Auto oxidation. That's you always were tripping me up. Yeah. We love our prefixes and, and suffixes and sciences, right? Just hydroiodic acid still looks wrong to me every time I write it out. It's too many vowels. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. So this, let's look at this practice problem. I like, kind of like these problem solving ones. They're a little bit different. You got, you've got C5H12. Which... Just that formula there tells us oh, something about that. What do you what do you notice about the number of hydrogens relative to the carbons? What does that tell us? Two n plus two. So there's gonna be it's alkane. It's an alkane and no rings. Yeah. So no pi bonds, no rings. So it's saturated. It's just, yeah, there's just a chain. So it could be a straight chain, but there are other saturated, sure. right? So it could be strong, but it does limit us to only three possibilities. All three of those are C5H12. So if those are our possibilities, when we monobrominate it, we get compound B. I think monobromination is HBR. HBr. So, um, no, sorry. If we're brominating an alkane, then that means we're doing the free radical bromination. Um, so, if we brominate 
if we brominate this compound, we have two different, two distinct secondary carbons, right? They should be relatively close to the same stability. So the fact that we only make one compound when we brominate it, can we eliminate any of these based on that? <laughs> can we eliminate the third one? There's the there's a quaternary carbon and the all primary. So probably would so it, it'll be slower, but it'll still brominate. It'll still be like all, all of those methyls are identical to each other, right? So those two, we've limited, we're down to just those two as our possibilities. When you treat B, so let's add, add the bromines. B is one of those two, right? We try treat B with a strong base. What's it going to do? What type of reaction? And we get two different products. Is that enough to say which of these is B? Can you do can you do an elimination reaction with a quaternary carbon? Okay. There's no hydrogen on the quaternary carbon, so you can't pull one off, right? So there's B. Then so, which means we can also draw A. There's A and B. That's either C or D. That's the bulk of this problem. One is getting it to the point where, okay, here are my, my four molecules, because then the rest of it is, if you treat B with T-butoxide, which version do you get? And C or D are interchangeable. It doesn't give us enough information to say which one is which. If it said something about a major product, then we could say that it's going to go with the more substituted alkene as the major product for an elimination, but it doesn't really specify. So C and D are interchangeable. Um, if we did use a sterically hindered base, do we get C or D as the major product for the elimination? Sterically hindered, um, look at the Hoffman, so C. C, big O. And then the opposite for part C, should use numbers set of letters for the uh, for the sub questions. If you use a non sterically hindered base, you'll get the Zeta sub product. So D, or the one we have labeled as D. Cool. Well, we actually made it through a whole lot of slides. So good job hanging in there. I definitely did not write down most of my notes, but I can go back. <laughs> right. We have the recording. You have the PDF of the slides. Um, so 